We are now going to talk to Kira and Delphine to learn more about how our clothes are being made and how we can ensure that we do go towards a future where the fashion industry becomes more responsible of every worker who is in it. So, girls, what can you tell me about your big campaign, Good Clothes, Fair Pay? Um, right, well, um, at Fashion Revolution, so we believe that there's no sustainable fashion without fair pay, which is why Good Clothes Fair Pay is such an important campaign for us because it demands living wage legislation for the fashion industry as a whole. So what is the current situation with the wages in the fashion industry? So most of the workers that make our clothes earn so little that they cannot escape poverty and um, the majority of workers are women and they earn on average about 45% less than they, than they need to provide for themselves and their families. Um, and this is despite working really gruelling hours. They can't afford to do things like put healthy food on the table, um, live in adequate housing, access healthcare, and some even struggle to send their children to school. And so, as you can see, the fashion industry is a very unequal and unfair system. And n not only that, but there's also, when it comes to wages, low wages are also a gendered issue. So, on one hand, we can see that most government wo workers are women and they earn already less than their male counterparts. Not only that, but when you look at who actually goes into debt to shop those clothes, it's mostly women, whereas if you look at the CEOs of all these big fashion brands, they're mostly men. So it kind of raises a question as to where does the money go when we think about women going to debt to buy clothes, women going to debt to make these clothes, whereas those big fashion CEOs keep on making more and more money. So just to give you an example, um, it takes on average, I think, four days for some fashion CEOs to make as much money as it would take a garment worker in Bangladesh to make across their entire life. Oh so that really, yeah, that really illustrates the issue here. Um, and we've seen that, obviously, uh, women workers and, you know, the the value that they provide in the industry has been massively undervalued and they've been massively underpaid, but it's not, it's not, for, well, it's not for no reason. It's actually been a system that's been built this way specifically. But it's not just about women. It's also about other groups, um, at-risk groups, such as migrant workers, so home workers, so workers who might not work in the factory but work at home, as well as child workers. And we know that, especially in the fashion industry, um, the biggest leader of child labour is actually poverty. And the reason why is because as a garment worker, if you don't earn enough to provide for your family, then you may rely on your children to also provide additional income just to provide for your basic needs. So that really illustrates um, the issue with the fashion industry is that most garment workers are not able to provide for their basic needs, have to work really, really long hours and in some cases go into debt. While all these big fashion brands keep on making more and more profit. So this is why we really thought it was absolutely key as an organisation to lead our campaign on living wages and really put in place legislation for living wages uh, for garment workers worldwide. Mm. This is really important information to have when you do go online and yeah. we see all the trends being pushed at us on TikTok for fast fashion. This is the reality. So what can we do about all of this? So I think it's really important to look at what would a living wage mean for workers. Um, so it's worth saying that firstly, a living wage is not the same as a minimum wage. So in most places where our clothes are made, legal minimum wages are simply not enough for workers mm. to live on, to meet their needs and their families' needs. But a living wage, on the other hand, is enough to meet a worker's basic needs for them and their family to cover things like housing, food, healthcare, and so on. Um, and one of the issues we're really seeing with workers at the moment, garment workers, is that they have to work incredibly long hours and really excessive overtime just to make ends meet. Um, and these workers, again, predominantly women, are um, not only time poor, uh, not only money poor, sorry, but they're also time poor. And that's because because they're mainly women. They have after working long hours in the factory, they go home and they do a lot of unpaid work in their homes. So things like cooking, cleaning, looking after children and elderly parents. And this is why a living wage in a normal work week would be so transformative for them, because it would give them not only money, but also time back to you know, relax or pursue interests or spend time with family, kind of whatever they'd like to do. Um, and that's why we're really excited about the idea of living wage legislation for garment workers worldwide, because it would lift millions of workers out of poverty and it would be particularly transformative to women and other at-risk groups that Delphine spoke about. Sick. And that is, like, it's manageable, it can, ha it can happen. So how do you work with this campaign? How, like, 
actively what are you guys doing in this Good Clothes Fair Pay campaign? <laughs> um, absolutely, so Good Clothes Fair Pay is our living wage campaign, so it's a European citizens initiative, which means that we need one million signatures from EU citizens in order for it to be successful and for the European Union to introduce, potentially introduce or pressure them to introduce this type of legislation. So our campaign would ultimately require fashion companies who want to sell their products in the EU market to ensure that the garment workers across their whole supply chain, whether you're based in Bangladesh, in the US, in Italy and so on, um, they would have to ensure that they're paid a living wage. So it it's, would be an absolutely like groundbreaking campaign for the fashion industry and it's a uh, I think it's the first living wage campaign oh, within the fashion industry. Yeah, so fine, we're so. really excited about yeah. it. But once they launch, we really need your signature if you're an EU citizen because we need one million signatures to send this message. So you can do that at goodclothesfairpay.eu. We can do it. <laughs> one million. <laughs> Thank you so much for teaching us about your campaign, uh, Good Clothing Fair Pay. I think it's super interesting. I love what you guys do. We need one million signatures by the end of 12 months for the EU to actually bring up this issue and put it into legislation of workers right in the fashion industry. So go to goodclothesfairplay.eu to make your signature. Hi guys, I'm here with Matthew Needham, who's an artist in London. We're here at Sarah Band Foundation. I'm gonna head down into your studio. Yeah, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Just can't get trip. Yeah. Very, very old. Hello. So yeah, this is the Sarah Band Studios. Where the magic is Yeah, feel free to come through. Come on in. I, I'm starting to get really jokey, sorry. The I think we need to slow down time for a little bit. Oh, sorry, this no, no, it's fine. Walking. For camera. <laughs> <laughs> Sprinting away. That's how we normally walk as humans. No, of course, yeah. Yeah, it's just straight down. Kitchen. Cute. Yes. And then how many people are here? There's 15 studios, but some of them are shared. Um, so there's a few of them. Sick. But Shana, yeah, Shana just had an exhibition wow. uh, a couple of weeks ago. I love that. Yeah, really great painter. Hello, Lucy Jagger. This Hello. is Lucy Jagger. Okay. Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you. Mm -hmm. You're just... And this is the studio. So how do you work with recycled materials? I, ups well, I've upcycled for like the last six years, but I think for me, it like, I started six years ago intensely and realized what it was. But I think before that, I've just always been upcycling. I've always been fascinated with old objects and stories behind them and telling those stories and origins and respecting the origins of the, of mm. the materials. So it's never just purely been about aesthetic. Where um, do you think that fascination came from? My dad. Yeah? yeah. Why is that? So my dad's a carpenter and a joiner, so okay. he used to make windows, I guess. Um, and now he works on like renovating old houses in Leicestershire. So he like takes out old windows, which is why we have like a lot of windows here. Oh, right. So this is from your dad? They're all from my dad, That's yeah. so cool. So all these clients' houses that he works on. So I think for me, I'm almost like a builder who's an artist. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. It's, I can't like fix a window, but I can tell stories of the windows. Mm. So it's, it's a different um, approach to it. But yeah, but using this sort of aesthetic, I grew up in a house that was never finished. So it kind of- Same. Right? Oh yeah, I grew up in a very, very old house that my parents just like kept like redoing. Really? To, like, but like year after year, like, like one room after one room. Yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. So my whole childhood is like the whole process of like seeing things change slowly. Yeah, that's It's funny with the windows, the very first studio I ever recorded in was an old window factory. Really? Yeah, in Norway. Oh, we have that connection. Random window windows. connection. Is this all part of your new exhibition this week for, no, sorry, la next, next week, week for Earth Day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, is this a part of that? Yeah, so the exhibition is called The Anthropologist. Right. And The Anthropologist is an exhibition that talks about our interaction with objects and nature and how we curate the world around ourselves how we see ourselves as the ultimate race, as humanity, and how we feel like we have ownership over the world. And these relics or artifacts are relics that you could walk down the street and find yourself. But by putting them in this space, I want the audience to kind of look at them in a, in a, in a different way. It's kind of you're like you're looking at the value of the object, you're looking at the, the history, you're kind of questioning where it comes from. You're thinking, that's a buried jumper that I found in the, in, the, in a construction yard, you know, that would have taken 200 years to biodegrade, but then it's got moss growing on it and the world's kind of like taken over. 
So here is one of your pieces for the exhibition next week at Earth Day. Can yeah. you tell us about it? Yeah, so this is called the boiler suit. Um, it's one of the window tanks. So there's four of these window tanks that are suspended on the walls and they're lit up with LED lighting. And they sort of showcase the garments in a different way. So you sort of illuminate as sort of like a halo around the garments. It's almost like showing it as an artifact with the light. I think it kind of elevates it. Um, so the process of making these is that I'll find a garment that feels right to put inside a frame or if it fits well. Mm -hmm. um, I wear a lot of boiler suits myself, as you can tell. <laughs> um, so yeah, so it feels quite fitting to put one of these in uh, a window. Um, but it's this process of turning the garments inside out Mm. And picking them, taking pockets, and um, replacing them. So, like all of these pieces here have all been restitched. So, at a first glance, you'll kind of think, oh, it's just an inside out garment. Mm. But actually, as you look closer, you realize that there's a rucksack strap, there's pockets here that have been added, but it talks about how they've been constructed. It talks about, in a visual way, it you know, allows you to make your own story up of where it comes from, or like how it's made, you know, who made that, who wore it, what did they do when they are wearing it. Okay. It's an artifact, it's not just a garment, it's one of 3,000 units or however, made, however many made in the first place, but it's immortalised between these two windows and it kind of elevates it into a different space. Sick, it's really cool. Like, do you have any hopes for the future in terms of the fashion industry and what direction it's going in? And for sure. I mean, I've worked in fashion, I've studied fashion. Um, I don't think I place myself within fashion now. I think the fashion industry has a lot to catch up on mm. um, in terms of sustainability and, you know, the way, you know, e e ecology and like the way that we interact with the world. Um, and especially because now a lot of people are more conscious than we used to be. Um, I think it's important to just educate ourselves and understand that we're constantly learning and there's no experts, you know, but we're all learning from each other and it's part of the human experience, really. Absolutely. Because you're also an advisory board member for the Fashion Open Studio. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about that? So Fashion Open Studio is the showcasing platform for Fashion Revolution. Mm. So it was founded around three years ago um, and it was to showcase all the designers, the amazing designers in London and across the world who work with sustainability and sustainable practices, upcycling, recycling. Um, yeah, so that's what it is. And they asked me to be a board member a couple of years ago now, I think. Cool, so how is yeah. your work there? How do you... How, what, what do you do? Well, what happens <laughs> behind the scenes? Um, so I do a lot of like art direction and projects. Uh, a, a big project that we've done for about five years now is Disco Make, um, which is an upcycling party essentially, um, where <laughs> yeah, where guests can come and like upcycle garments. But it's very like party vibes and like you dance and with the things that you've made. And but that's great because really cool. it doesn't need to be boring. No, like, this no, is no. Fun stuff. Yeah, I mean, d yeah, disco make. We've we've done like five hundred people disco makes now. It's like it's quite intense. Um, Amazing. When does this yeah. happen? I want to come. <laughs> <laughs> well, Matthew, thank you so much for having us here. It was really cool to see your space. Thank Good you luck. for coming. Thank yeah. you so much. For our final step to all become fashion revolutionaries, we have to understand that we are all interconnected and how this needs to be a global movement. And that's why I wanted to hear from Fashion Revolution's country coordinators from India, Germany, Guatemala, Sudan and France. Hi everybody, I'm Catherine uh, from Fashion Revolution France. Uh, I have joined Fashion Revolution in 2014, first as a communication officer, and uh, then in 2020 I became country coordinator for the French team. Uh, my unique experience in leading this change, uh, we rely on a strong community in France. This is the strength of our network. And we are uh, in the team, we are all professional in the fashion industry. Uh, some are, are teachers, other are brands, uh, or uh, whatever, uh, every, every profession. Um, we have always tried to dialogue with brands and institutions, and, and this is starting to become concrete now in France. Our main target is still citizens, however, through conferences in school and social network. We put education at the front, forefront. And we organize repair and upcycling workshop whenever the opportunity arises. Everybody is welcome to join Fashion Revolution France. All you have to do is join the association to participate in our working groups. 
because all together we can revolutionize fashion. Bye bye. Hi, I'm Ariane Pieper, country coordinator for Fashion Revolution Germany. I joined the revolution just at the beginning. In 2013, we as a German team were asked if we would like to participate in the campaign. And I volunteered in those days and helped out wherever I can. I asked very often who made my clothes and social media. And I simply followed the movement. And then in 2016, I was asked if I would like to become country coordinator and I st stepped up. And that's what I'm doing already a couple of years and I enjoy it very much. A highlight for me is always when people come together, when they join forces and you feel that they are all driven by the same idea to have a better, to have better standards in fashion industry and to help the planet not to suffer by all the exploitation. To join Fashion Revolution, there are so many ways and I'm really happy that um, there's options for everyone. You don't need to be a professional in fashion, you don't have to have pre-experience. You can be just a pupil, a student um, that has realized that the fashion industry is going the wrong way and you simply want to yeah, be part in the change. Hi everyone, I'm Alexandra and I'm the country coordinator for the Fashion Revolution for team. I thought myself a fashion revolutionary even before actually being a team. I never imagined actually being part of, of a team. Um, Leading it, it's a dream come true, honestly. Um, it's, it's, this smile, it's completely true. I feel one of the, of the greatest accomplishments was, is still nurturing a team that is as committed as the team we have now. Hello, I'm Suki Desange Lenz and I'm the country head for Fashion Revolution India. I joined Fashion Revolution in 2014. You can join the Fashion Revolution with a first step action of asking the brands you're wearing, who made my clothes. Tag Fashion Revolution in, tag the brands in, tag your local Fashion Revolution teams in and let them know that you care. Fashion Revolution is a constant reminder of just how globally connected we all are, um, but how we need to affect change on a very local level. That's been so unique in our learnings and findings and beyond that, just in terms of building a movement, you really need to have strong foundations and you have to understand and listen to the local communities. You have to be on ground and understand what the problems are because there might be issues globally, but locally sometimes there's a whole new movement or change or dialogue going on. So being able to bridge countries together with local um, issues and local change has been inspirational and it's been unique because together we can revolutionize fashion. My name is Hadil Osman. I am a creative director, stylist, sustainability consultant and designer and I'm the country coordinator of Fashion Revolution Sudan. I officially joined Fashion Revolution in 2020, however I became first familiar with it in 2015 and it has completely transformed how I view the fashion industry today. Even though sustainability is deeply rooted within my culture, a lot of people are not aware that there is an actual term for it and there's a whole movement behind the situation. So it allowed me to raise awareness and also engage in amazing discussions with fashion practitioners and designers within Sudan, as well as researchers and people who are generally advocates for this uh, globally. So it was quite a challenge to find my people. I'm still trying to find my people and to make a community around me um, and around Fashion Revolution Sudan. However, this challenge is very fruitful because it allowed me to research and understand the infrastructure within my country and to see how we can move forward and how we can start an actual fashion industry here locally that is completely sustainable, that is very ethical, um, that takes care of the people and the planet first before anything. Because together we can revolutionize fashion. Thank you so much for joining us on this journey. I think I feel pretty equipped to be a fashion revolutionary now. I hope you feel the same. This has been really cool. I'm Sigrid, thanks so much for watching.